Okay, let me give you a bit of a background first. OWASP, oh, sorry, so um, MyBBC is the BBC's new identity and personalization platform. We have a security council tasked with implementing best practices. And this presentation that I'm about to give you is aimed at general devs, testers, managers, and product managers. And it aims to show what we do, how it helps enable teams and individuals, and how people can engage with us and learn the new systems we have created. Because the whole point is us to enable people, not to be a block, but to enable teams to deliver more securely and more uh, safely and quicker. So what do people think when they think of a security council? They think of shadowy people meeting in secret, making decisions, enforcing policies, and it's all kind of uh, it's whispered about in the corridors of my BBC, but it's not really, uh, no one really knows what it does. So what we actually do, or who we really are, we're security champions, individual people embedded in different teams. We, uh, we, tr uh, we're, we are guided with ensuring best practices within individual teams and with uh, guiding developers and increasing their skill set. So we're developers, developers and test, we have information security people. The BBC has a dedicated information security team and they are working with the security champions. We have management, because the management is taking security very seriously. As I'll get on to in a second, and we have other interested parties as well. So what we do, we enable teams. We enable teams to feel that they're doing security correctly and that they can deliver on time and with all their uh, compliance needs met. We track security issues across my BBC. I'll, I'll get onto that a bit more in a moment. But it's very important for us to have joined up thinking across my BBC as there are about oh, seven or eight different projects under that one banner. We provide the joined up thinking. Uh, we learn new skills. We create threat models and attack surface analysis. I'll show you some examples in a second and we spread knowledge. A spreading knowledge is very important. Each team with a security champion, uh, the security champion is supposed to increase the knowledge and come up with uh, a new bits of information to give to those people. <laughs> and maintain a security area. Why do we do it? The BBC has to take security seriously. It's a huge store of personal data, including children's data, it's the most up-to-date uh, collection of information about what people watch, what they view, what they read in the UK. It's under intense scrutiny by the Information Commissioner and the EU. Fines of up to 4% turnover, that's £200 million we could be fined if we have a serious breach. That's a lot of license payers' money, so that's a lot of people. Like that's, almost like, that's almost as much as a BBC Christmas party. It, it's <laughs> we can be fined for internal failures as well as actual breaches. This is important. We don't actually have to have an, internal, uh, an external breach. An internal breach will also be very serious, so we've got to watch out for that. And there have been cases where things have happened and we've been uh, pulled up a few times. I can't really go into details. There are many projects within my BBC. Again, that creates problems with projects working with each other, trying to talk to each other. Uh, you know how it is. It's just all big organisations are very siloed, and BBC is no no uh, different. And a problem in one system can spread to another system. So a lot of these systems they join up, they are upstream, they're downstream. So data has to be tracked throughout the whole data lifecycle. I, I, I would be hacked. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Why why we do it? Well, we already know this. Okay. Clicker, clicker, clicker control is not one of my uh, things. Okay, so example that I show in my normal uh, presentation. This would normally be my BBC example, but obviously I can't show it to a room full of hackers. Uh, this is just like, like a trust boundary analysis. It's something that we do. I won't go into too many details. And then we'll have like a threat model, so we have scenarios and risks, discoverability, exploitability. I'm sure you all know what a threat model is, but this is aimed at the ground troops, the, the people who might not know exactly what we do. 
And the AppSec project, now this is the main thing that our developers and our product managers need to know about. It's the thing that they will interface with the most. It's a Jira project separate from the MyBBC projects. So it's outside the usual scrums, the usual workflows, the usual kind of uh, toing and froing of, of the day-to-day the, the, the -day business of the MyBBC project. And it tracks all the application security risks outside of the usual workflow. I jump my, uh, you know, the roadmaps and etc. So it's above the day-to-day -day scheduling of tasks, delivering of, of you know, roadmap items. It's used for escalation, accepting risk, or scheduling work to, to fix a risk. So it's not about tracking work done to fix risks. It's just about an overview and tracking the state of a prop, a state of a uh, of of security uh, in the MyBPC. So it's separate from the actual project level tickets. Whenever there's a risk created, whenever a risk is identified, we either sign it off or we create a separate thing to fix the actual, uh, a separate project specific ticket to fix the, the issue. What does this mean for you as a developer in my BBC? You can raise them for set concerns and they will be addressed. I think one of the reasons why people don't report security concerns or things that they know about is that they think it will be put on the backlog, it won't be seen, it won't be escalated, it will be just ignored. It happens, I've been there myself. But with this, it will be it will be seen. It will be escalated. Cross project concerns are not a problem. Cross team workflow issues are not a problem. It's, it's above all that. And the appropriate managers will be able to see and respond to your concerns. You can gain some valuable info set knowledge and skills as well. Part of this, of what we do, is to gain is to enable people to learn about InfoSec, and it's a very hot topic at the moment, and people are taking a lot of interest in it. So how to get involved as a MyBBC developer? Explore the AppSec tickets for your team, raise security tickets if there's something you spot or know of, they will be addressed, they won't be ignored. Talk to your security champion, see the threat model for your team, and remember that this is for you. This is for you as developers to address your security concerns and to deliver more secure data quicker and more uh, securely. Anyway, thanks a lot. Any, any questions? Okay, you. Uh, thank you. There's no problem. Uh, thank you. What are we doing with this? Uh, did we do threat modeling on uh, old applications as well, or just in new ones? We do threat modeling across uh, all the applications within my BBC. So every project has a security champion, and every uh, you know every project has a threat model and associated risks associated with it. So, uh, how how old would be your oldest application? Let's say I don't know about ten, fifteen years. Right. Well, my BBC is a new a new project within uh, BBC. All right. So no, if we tried to vet everything in BBC, it would be uh, a very it would be a huge undertaking. But because this is personalization, because this is you know an identity system as well, we've had to be extra extra careful with this. So we're trying to do security by the book, the best that we can do it. Thank you. Is that the answer? Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions for yourself? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. How do you deal with the uh, politics and the initial resistance? <laughs> the initial resistance. Uh, well, the AppSec project gets, gets uh, around that a lot. Uh, we have had a lot of buy-in from senior managers. Uh, they, they know that they're, you know, it's their name on the line. Um, how this works, how the AppSec project works, is that if a low-level manager doesn't want to sign off on it with something such as how valuable their data is or how much we should protect it, he can escalate it. Which sounds like passing the buck, but it's not. What it happens is that we, the decision gets passed to the right person eventually. The person who is paid to make that decision. The person who has to kind of make the call one way or another. So that gets around a lot of the resistance. And the fact that it's separate from the usual workflow and the usual kind of toing and froing of the projects means that there isn't that much resistance. Is it, is it, uh, is it? No, go ahead. 
just wondering if it is A, easy for them to ignore it, or B, it just leads to risk fatigue whereby they just don't say, yeah, accepting it, accepting it, but not really. Well, it's true. Um, and I've been in that situation where, you know, uh, where, like, for example, my manager, uh, there's a whole load of stuff that he wants to accept. But I sit down with him and we debate every single point individually. And, you know, I'm happy to accept risk, um, but I won't let stuff go by which is actually risky. And as a security champion, I'm empowered to put a block on that and maybe escalate that past his, past his head on, up to his higher manager and the guy after him as well. You know? So it's the security champions are kind of like people pushing the buttons and making sure that everything gets done by the right person or that a fix is put in place. So that doesn't happen, that doesn't, that doesn't creep in. No, not yet, it's still early days, but yeah. I see your point, it's a very valid point. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I think you labeled yourself. By the way, your question was very good because the minute I heard the word polit uh, uh, politics, I'm thinking, what kind of politics are we talking about? So it's corporate politics, yeah, yeah. not even cyber politics. Yeah. Um, as a security champion, mm -hmm. Are you able to tell what type of attacks the BBC is getting, whether they are the, um, the generic attacks or whether they are targeted? Um, yes. Uh, we have different teams and whatever, but we, we do know what's happening, what's going on. But I can't divulge them here. No, no, no. <laughs> are you seeing an escalation in targeting? Uh, I don't have that knowledge okay. at the moment. Um, yeah, I don't. I can't answer that. Yeah. I can't say that we're, we're being targeted I'm, or not. I'm spe speculating that you would be. Well, I, think I, think, I think most firms are. And, and no, I think the I think the uh, okay, well, to ask really because it's a personalisation. So it's a yeah. Personal data because previously, BBC viewers online were completely anonymous. Yes. Now they can log in. And BBC knows exactly who they are, where they live, how old they are, and all sorts of other personal data. Yes. So suddenly, this presents a completely different value to attackers Absolutely. than just a uh, standard BBC website and uh, say iPlayer services. Uh, absolutely, and this is why we have implemented this at quite considerable cost. I mean, it is there is work there. It is a, a quite a, a big undertaking, but. That's why we have to do it, because this is much more valuable. I mean, the BBC has been protected uh, up until now because A, it wasn't that much of a target, and also hackers like the BBC. It's got a bit of a brand, it's got a bit of a reputation, but this is valuable data, and people might be interested in it. Actually, if I may add to Sam's point, mm. is I'll take you one step, one, one, one level higher. Sure. The threat isn't just only those who are interested in the habits or the details of the users. Mm -hmm. The threat is coming from those who recognize the BBC is a pillar of UK Western society and they have an agenda from a political cyber terrorism point of view. So, yes. I mean, hacking them would be a, a good uh, you know, story that would be in the papers. Absolutely. So, and that's worth defending. Uh, absolutely. Okay. And if uh, not, if not nation states, then murder. I'm sure I would love, love if something bad would happen. Not that I'm uh, accusing, but yeah, but you know, a lot of people would like to see the BBC fail, and and it would ha it does have certain emotional value that way. Of course, of course. Thank you. Any more questions? Can you talk a little on the collaboration on the threat modeling and what you tools you use and how you scale that? Oh, okay. Um, threat modeling is a collaboration between security champion, the technical architects, and other people. It's normally owned by the both the technical architects and security champions. And it's just a question of looking through, seeing what our assets are, what are the risks, um, what how exploitable those risks are, and how discoverable those risks are as well. Because if no one knows about a risk, then it's not as risky. They don't know the exploit exists. So there's the collaboration is normally within team, but obviously people will get together and track data from say you know the iPlayer right down to the data level back up, for example. And we're organizing that and we're making sure that's happening. That's sort of the second stage that we're currently doing. Um, 
and with the guidance of Dennis Cruz here, uh, who's, who's been working with us on this. And gradually we're coming up with end-to-end, -end, uh, very sort of elaborate data models. And it makes a difference. We've discovered some, some interesting things there. What kind of tools are you using? Uh, right, what kind of tools? Um, we are using, uh, well, really it's just manual analysis at the moment. Uh, we are currently thinking of in integrating Zap into our build pipelines. Uh, so that plugin thing was very interesting. Um, and just kind of visual modeling and dis discussion, really. But for the, the thread model, is, it's confluence plan to ML. Oh, yes. So, so, so yeah, 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 like graph. Um, Graph and, and confluence and, and what have you. That makes a big difference. It so does. Because you basically, <clears throat> it's actually much more, much more easy to get and much more easy to do. And, and so, so basically, so he's actually done some great threat models where he used graph, graph base, right, to connect the stuff. It doesn't look initially as pretty, but actually when you look at it, it's so much more maintainable. Yeah, right? it is. And, and then confluence allows you to import that. So, so basically the wiki pages are actually the leading threat modeling documents. And also, they link directly to the Jira tickets. Okay. The thing that I wasn't sure there was that the, all the Jira tickets are mapped with that thing, so we can actually see in the confluence, see what risks are accepted, where, what are they working on. So that page becomes a living document, which is always updated. Yeah, I'm stuck on the Microsoft tools on a yeah. Mac environment. Those are VMs are running. It's a bit, yeah. it's a bit painful. Yeah. For you, being able to comp uh, being able to collaborate is, is very important. Using the right right documentation tools. The, the point about Windows threat modeling tool was actually very good because what we're lacking at OWASP right is an open source threat modeling tool. So again, I urge everyone who has skills and that time to contribute. Actually, you can you're free to create a project like this and contribute it to OWASP, but that would be absolutely fantastic. Why wait for Microsoft to create a proprietary tool which only works under Windows? There you go. If you have time, please contribute. Okay, so any more questions? Uh, okay, Matt at the back. Yeah. Now we mentioned the weekly sessions. Oh, yeah, so we also have weekly sessions. So every week we get together as a security council to you know, ch uh, compare notes, discuss how we're going to approach this. That's very important. We don't want to be, um, you know, sort of on our own, each one doing their own little thing. So it's very, very unified. We do have a common purpose, and we have excellent buy-in from sort of the middle-level managers and the higher-level managers of that project, and that's very important because without that, the whole thing would be sunk, and that's very important. So, the ma getting the middle-level managers at least to sign off and to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it is uh, key to all this as well. But generally, they're happy to do that because it, it makes it easy for them to see what's going on. And it makes it easy for developers to tell them about stuff in a, in a, in a kind of. A, Concise way. Uh, did you use a specific, a specific methodology to create the attack scenarios and the threat actors for your threat model? Did you use a methodology like Stride or something like that? Yes, okay. yes. Um, so the initial threat models were kind of ad hoc, but then we went through each level and we applied Stride analysis to each, say, each trust boundary, for example. Can it be spoofed, tampered with, repudiation? And that was very important just to get a better feel of how these things work across the, 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 the project or the application. Even if you don't pick up on stuff initially, it gives you much better grounding on what you, on how, how threats could manifest within your system and the topography of your threat surface. How did you prioritize the findings? Uh, well, so... When I went through and created the threat model, I created uh, tickets immediately based on every risk that I found, and then I've gone through them with my manager, and then ones that we've signed off, we've signed off, accepting the risk. The ones that we are, uh, we want to fix, we have created fixed tickets for within our sprint. Then we prioritize them according to our, our you know, roadmap goals and our actual backlog of actual stuff we want to develop. If there's a long delay, if it's like low priority, then we will accept the risk of the initial AppSec ticket for say three months, or for six months, and we will accept that. So we, we're still signing up the risk, but only on a temporary basis, and then when that ticket, when the fixed ticket comes up in the, in the Scrum or the Kanban, then we, uh, then we fix it and then sign off. So you can accept risk for like short, short periods of time, and that helps with prioritization. Otherwise, 
like the man said over here, uh, you can become just you know sign up everything permanently and it becomes risk sign up fatigue or blindness. Thank you. Okay. Hey, so in an agile environment, how do you ensure that um, design considerations are taken into account in the stories? So do you work, for example, with the product manager and he adds something in sort of the um, fatted alius and saying part of the what needs to have security design considerations or how do you ensure that as the roadmap, as the iterations go on and on and on, the context of the security doesn't change with the context of the feature and then that gets exposed over time? That's a good question. Um, my answer to that is Generally, if there's a conflict between the security side of things and the roadmap and what we're trying to produce, initially we will discuss that with, say, the product owner, the product manager. Generally, as far as I understand, with Agile, the what we're developing is separate from other stakeholders and other, and other things. So I let the business people decide on the business side of things. It's when we come to actually code stuff and you know, the integration tests and what have you, then I will raise security concerns. Generally speaking. And you've done threat models as the future comes along, right? Yes, that's right. Yes. Is where you, you yeah. Cover it, right? Yeah. yeah, so the idea is yeah. that the design changes yeah. over time. How do you make sure that you're on top of it and you know oh, that the okay, design right. has changed? But that's why oh, yeah. the threat model should be the source of truth. That's the logic. So okay. if you find that a threat model has you know, bird of course, then that's a problem that needs to be addressed. But do you do that with, for example, tests? You assume that the application works this way, and then when it doesn't, you get alerted, or do you implicitly trust? Right. Uh, that's where the gap, that's where the gray area comes Yeah. Well, for example, um, every time we have a new feature that's like a new pattern, shall we say, we will create a, an overarching sort of thread model for that. So let's say we have a new field, as they, it's a secure field this time, that needs to be encrypted. If we haven't already done a threat model for at writing secure data to UAS, then we'll create that, and that can be used for further secure fields, or uh, other, like say, fields that you need to get, or what have you. I don't know, have I answered your question? I don't think I have. A bit, yeah, it's uh, always a struggle, because <laughs> you're, uh, ultimately, you're depending on people to say, we are doing this, and then you immediately understand, you know, you have to understand the implications of it yeah. and, and understand because the only other way is that you actually have active checks. You say, this website works this way, and we have approved the design based on these assumptions. The minute that you start talking to another third party and you're passing data, or you're doing this or doing that, um, if you don't actually have that conversation between the product teams and so forth, if anything breaks down, you don't actually have that visibility until the, unless you're actually designing security tests that checks for the, the design or overall threat assumptions. Yes, that is um, that is the next phase of what we're doing with my BBC and the Security Council. We want to have automated tests and we also want to have cross project tests as well to make sure that if someone teaches the field in one project, ramifications are picked up in other projects. And that's absolutely right. Yeah. That's the next stage of what we're, we're, we're doing. We're starting on that already. So one of the key is when you close a ticket from the project side, you shouldn't close the ticket on the security side until you have proof. But that takes a very good mature test environment. But the way to achieve that in the short term is to use the pen tests and the security reviews at the end to cross check it. So the logic is instead of having a black box test, I pay some, some dude to tell you how good they are, you should say, here's our threat models, here's our code, here's our app, find gaps, right? And then, and then you say, okay, my threat model shows me this, but my app shows me this, there's a gap. And once you reach that level of maturity, that blind spot should be a major incident because there's a gap in your flow, right? So you should get to the point where when somebody looks at an assessment, you have a parity between your understanding of your world and it doesn't matter if you know I have 10 vulnerabilities. Like I said, you might have a critical vulnerability here, but my edge bet is nobody's going to find it. Mm -hmm. So that's realistic from a business point of view. My go, I can live with that. But what, I don't, what you don't want to see is gaps. What you don't want to see is, hey, how come we, when we look at the attack surface, it actually looks like this? 
right? How come your design mentioned these assumptions, but when, and which was great, but actually when we look at reality, it doesn't match that, right? But that's like, you know, a next good level. Okay, thank you very much, Shane. Good talk, guys. Okay, I think this is almost the end. It's just uh, the thing which is remaining to say is a very big thank you to uh, Empiric Recruitment Agency which hosted us tonight and uh, provided us with uh, food and drinks and they just told me we can uh, hang around until 10 o'clock and the bar is still open. Uh, after which if you're still uh, thirsty you'll have to find a uh, bar nearby which I'm pretty sure there are plenty of them uh, in this area. I would like to say a big thank you to all our speakers, uh, Jeremy King, um, Gareth Hayes and Shane Kelly and obviously Lauren who was all the way in Canada presenting over Skype uh, remotely it's amazing how technology works but it worked this time okay uh, so a uh, short announcements again so for those of you who are coming or those of you who work in organizations who have developers who are coming to our hackathon and capture the flag competition they are Monday and on Tuesday so they're happening not here they're happening in the works offices in Soho Okay, and uh, there will be prizes which we are donated, so uh, um, please make sure developers can actually make it. Uh, the next event is going to be in January, the day is going to be confirmed, and the menu for it will be confirmed as well, so please make sure you subscribe to the mailing list if you're not subscribed, and follow us on Twitter. Okay, thank you very much everyone, and let's... And if they have a venue... And if they have a venue, they would like to yeah, host if us. You would like to, so, to, okay, so, if you would like to uh, uh, offer your venue for the next meeting, please do. And also, if you'd like to speak at the next event, uh, please email us, Call for Speakers is open. And uh, if you know someone within your organizations who you think can present a talk which will be valuable to this audience, please contact us. Thank you. Thank you.